problems with cranes. Assessing overhead crane tracking is an important part of crane safety. In this webinar, we're going to cover what an overhead crane rail assessment is and how it should be completed. We'll also share specifications from the Crane Manufacturers Association of America, otherwise known as CMAA, and review some common tracking issues. My name is Gisela Clark. I am the eMarketing Specialist at Columbus McKinnon and will be your host for today's webinar. Presenting today will be Peter Cook, our Training Manager covering rigging hoist and load securement. Supporting Peter will be Tom Reardon, Technical Instructor for Columbus McKinnon. It's going to be nice. They're going to kind of go back and forth today, so you're going to get a lot of great insights from these two gentlemen. As I said earlier, we are recording the session and the recording link will be added to our YouTube channel. All in attendance will receive a link to the recording probably by the end of the day tomorrow. Everyone is in listen-only mode, so we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A pane on the right side of your page. We'll take five minutes at the end to answer your questions. And again, those that go unanswered, Peter will directly address after the fact. So, and as I mentioned earlier, in case you joined a little late, um, after each webinar we select one or two questions to be used in our blog for the following week. If your question is chosen, we'll send you Columbus McKinnon a promotional item, like a cool shirt, hat, work glove, something like this. So type your questions in the Q&A pane. We love to, uh, to hear what, what's on your um, mind as far as this subject goes. So thank you for your attention, and now I'll turn the meeting over to Peter so that we can begin. Thank you, Gisela. And uh, again, I'm joined by Tom Rudner. Is our, uh, Tom is our guru of overhead cranes, so those of you that are on, you have a really good chance to ask some really good questions that Tom can answer for you. Um, so today's topics, we're going to do uh, signs of tracking issues, uh, talk about rail assessments, and then also look at uh, end truck and wheel assessments as well. So those are the three main areas we're going to cover today. And uh, as with all the webinars that we do, they are, these webinars are by no means a substitution for any regulations or standards, and we encourage all of you to seek out those regulations and standards for clarity and information. And again, this is just a, a reference webinar, by, and by no means uh, should you ever substitute the information that we provide for any, any of that information. So we'll get started. Um, signs of tracking issues. So how do you know you have a tracking problem with your crane? Um, you're seeing loose connections on girders, loud steel on steel, sound during bridge travel. That's probably a, a key one that most people would hear. Uh, bearing end truck wheels and rails having free, being frequently replaced, so you're, you're wearing something out because it's, the crane is working harder uh, to get past some areas where you're having tracking issues. Climbing of the wheels on uh, climbing the wheel flanges on the rail, damage to end trucks, broken wheel flanges, wheels pressing against the head rail, which is most likely making your steel on steel sound sometimes, and sluggish travel at certain areas of the runway that, that you might see. So you may mistakenly think you have a uh, possibly an electrical issue where it's stalling out, but it could be a tracking issue um, where it's, you know, we're getting uh, a problem area where it's getting sluggish. So if we suspect that we do have a tracking problem, we want to do a start off and possibly do a rail assessment. And we're going to talk about the rail assessment. And we'll start off with the runway or the support is basically what the runway is mounted on. And the items we need to inspect are tiebacks, bolts, the welds, and rail to girder offset. Okay. So we can see here we have a picture of a tie tie back. This is a fairly large crane. And uh, Tom, if you want to carry a comment on this picture, it's the product that's put out by Gantrex. It's a very sophisticated runway installation system. Uh, most tie backs are very simple. Uh, we'll have the I beam tied back to the the column with a weld or, or something like that. This is uh, it just removes lateral deflection, if you will, in the I-beam that supports the crane rail. Okay, thank you. So one of the things we do, what, where do we find uh, information on rail assessments? And we, what's out there for rail assessment is CMAA spec 70 and 74. Okay, so we start off with a single rail evaluation. Okay, you want to take measurements at approximately every 10 foot intervals. Ensure rail elevation was within the CMAA specifications, and rails should be level within plus or minus three eighths of an inch. And the maximum rate of change that you can have there is a quarter inch in every 20 foot. And Tommy mentioned that which which rail would you start off with to do that on the single rail evaluation? 
typically whatever your wherever your electrification so that's where I've always done it. Start wherever the electrification system is going to come into the crane. Call that your base or reference rail, and uh, shoot it. And make sure that the uh, the other rail starts out at the same elevation. Once you get those two right, you never have to uh, you never have to compare the two again, other than checking your work at the end of the install, so to speak. Thank you. So again, once you get that first reference rail, rail, the information on that, then you want to do the rail to rail evaluation. So you want to take this measurement approximately every 10 foot interval. And the rail to rail evaluation depends on the span of the runway. And you can see in the chart up there the span information. Okay, so if the length is less than 50 feet, you can your distance from rail to rail can be plus or minus three sixteenths of an inch. If it's greater than 50 feet but less than 100 feet, it's plus or minus a quarter inch. And if it's greater than 100 feet, it's plus or minus three eighths of an inch. And that's a pretty tight tolerance for that those spans. You wouldn't think it would be that tight, but uh, some pretty. Um, I, I was surprised when 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 learning about rail assessments how tight those were. Um, Railroad development problems are one of the leading causes of poor crane tracking and ultimate real bearing failures. And Tom, if you need to want to comment on that. Yeah, rail to rail, it is one of the most common buildings settle. Um, over time, buildings, buildings settle down. You get a very slight, uh, relatively speaking, a very slight uh, falling or dipping or dropping of one side of the rail. And it's going to cause the crane to shift to that side. And Peter will get into it here coming up. Um, you will see this uh, several different ways. Either you can watch the crane track, um, or you can ignore that and go back later, if you will, and look at the wheel wear patterns, and you will see that it's very much a single-sided type tracking issue. Uh, but these are not uh, inexpensive or cheap fixes, but they're very common causes for tracking problems. Excuse me, Tom, really quick. Um, if you're on speaker, could you go back to, there's like an echo. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone can hear you properly. Okay, so what would you like me to do? Can you, are you on the speakerphone? I am. Can you just hold it up, uh, disconnect the speaker portion so that, because there's a big echo when you speak. I'm sorry. Someone Is that any better? Call. Much better. Day and night. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that. Go ahead, That's Peter. Fine. Okay, so well then the next thing we need to do is look for single rail straightness. And again, you're going to start off with your reference rail. Okay, and you want to be sure. That, so you you check. We've checked elevation. We've checked rail to rail span. So then we're looking at single rail straightness. And you can the tolerance there is three eighths of an inch, and the rate of max rate of change is a quarter inch in twenty feet. So we're looking at how straight is that is that rail walking on us at, at all. So basically, your rail straightness probably time would affect the span at, at certain portions. Correct? I'm sorry. Repeat that, Pete. For the rail straightness, you know, if it's you know you're looking at rail straightness, that straightness would you know if we're off a little bit in the area, that would also affect affect the span in that area. Correct? Uh, it could if it's within a single rail. So far, we've talked about the considerations of putting a, a runway in and keeping them within CMAA's tolerances. Um, Peter's going to move on to um, another arena. Uh, we're just trying to show how critical and how tight these things are. If your single rail, your initial rail is put in crooked, so to speak, um, and it is curvy and it moves outside of the tolerance and certainly outside the maximum rate of change, if you were to span it perfectly, then your other rail would have the same changes. And it would be much like sending a roller coaster down a down a curve, a curvy track. So that's really the key part or reason for getting these things dead straight, as straight as they possibly can be. Okay, so you're reading the single rail straightness, you want to take your measures again every pox, every ten foot approximately. Um, you you want to do this right after the rail evaluation. Okay. Uh, Tom, why is that? Oh, excuse the rail, me, rail, the rail elevation. I'm sorry. It must be done after rail evaluation. Um, I'm not sure. Um, oh, elevation, not evaluation. After, if you uh, elevate the rail first and it's crooked, 
and you go back and straighten the rail, uh, the only way to do that is to affect whatever you have done to bring the elevation um, up. So you'll have to redo it. Um, you only do elevation once. Um, if you have to go back and, well, that's, I'll just leave it at that. Right, and this is usually caused, this is what's usually causing your, your crane to rack as it travels down the runway. And then here's your runway span, okay, which we, which we covered. Span should be taken with a precision instrument. Span should be taken using the reference rail as a benchmark. Reference rail is the rail installed on the power side, as Tom said, and rail span is a single most important measurement and alignment on a runway ensures it with acceptable CMA range and is a number one cause of tracking problems of overhead cranes. Another thing you can look at is the rail ID, and it should be orientated in the same direction. So if you look at rail, you'll, the manufacturer will be on there, and what pound rail will be on, will be on that rail. So if, the, if you'll say on your left side it's facing inward, your right side rail, you would want that information facing inward as well. It's just kind of, there's no, Tom, there's no spec out there that says that, but it's kind of a installer rule of thumb. It, it is. Uh, the people that manufacture the rail, as these things are being rolled, there's certain drift and tolerances that go in the, in the rolling process, and they have to come back every now and then and set that straight. And so if the rail head slightly drifts off the rail's web, um, as long as I keep these oriented in the same direction, uh, the relative difference between the heads, which is the important part, wouldn't change. Good. Hey, I have a quick question for you, Peter. Um, okay. Is there a particular order the rail assessment should be done in? Like, where would be the best place to start? You want me to answer that? Yes, please, Tom. Okay, what, what we've discussed right now is the considerations for putting a runway in uh, the alignment tolerances, how close they are. A rail assessment, what Peter's talking about right now, this would be the last thing that you would do after suspecting um, a runway alignment issue. This is the least, or the last thing, the most expensive part is the survey that Peter's talking about now. As we progress on, we're going to get into very simple things that you can do, particularly as a crane inspector or anyone who goes up there and take a look at it, uh, very specific things and simple things that you can do to determine that what we're talking about now is not correct. So the direct answer to your question, Gisela, is mm -hmm. something like the right rail assessment, taking measurements and looking for span and level. Um, that would not be done at any pre-described interval. It would be done based on the characteristics of the crane. Okay, and thank you, Tom. And one other thing, um, Roger on the call made a comment about um, a sign that there's a tracking issue. He just wanted to mention that the crane is, another sign that there's a tracking issue is that the crane is throwing collector shoes because the ASCE rail is not in line with the conductor bar. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, though that there's yeah that we you know we were just naming a few, but certainly that that is that could be another one. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> thanks for bringing that to the attention. That's very good. Um, also, during your rail inspection, you want to look you know you want to look for the, looking at the J bolts and looking for loose missing bolts. Uh, make sure they're properly sized to hold the rail correctly. You can see that chart there on what sizes you would need based on your rail size. Okay. Are you looking for any cracks, for T cracks, bends, and threaded areas, nut tightness, and is it square to the rail being perpendicular? Um, Tom, as, the, as you're using the crane, right, the rail is allowed to float in length direction. It's allowed to walk a little bit, not side. You don't want any side to side, but so it could walk in the length direction so that you have rail movement. Yeah, all rail needs to be able to, to walk or, or move lengthwise, never side to side. But there's a lot of masses at work here. And, Certainly, J bolts are subject to to a lot of force, and it's one of the reasons to keep a real close eye on them. <clears throat> so there's the areas that we're in that there's a actual the J bolts there and the areas to look at and, and the tightness. Um, but you don't want to arbitrarily go in and to start tightening down J bolts uh, for no reason. Just all oh, the bolts lose all tight, you know, or I don't feel it's tight enough, because uh, then you could knock your rail out of alignment.
rail clips. So you're looking at your rail clips, look, look for loose missing bolts, crack welds, make sure the nuts are properly torqued, they're properly sized, and then look for rail pad extrusions. So you, you can have a pad underneath the rail head and then basically as if that rail is moving side to side or it's starting to wear out, it could extrude out and that's a sign that the rail is out of alignment. Now, Tom, if you want to, anything you want to say on that? The rail pad is part of a, a system, a runway installation system, and um, by all accounts, it's it's a good system. It reduces vibration. Uh, if there is a downside, if if you have rail alignment issues, especially any issues that would cause the crane to rack or forcibly go side to side more than it normally would, then the rail itself is going to rock back and forth, and it it has a tendency to to squeeze out the neoprene or whatever that polymer is that, that is uh, a part of the rail uh, pad underneath it. Again, looking at this and seeing plastic extrusion would be a sign um, that you've got some tracking issues going on. In other words, uh, there's forces at work going side to side on this rail that are undesirable. Would that, is that rail pad required, Tom, or is it is just an, an added? Um, no, it's, it's like... Uh, it's like Dolby Sound in your car. It's a, um, without naming the company, it's an excellent product. They have a runway installation system. Um, it makes for a smoother ride. Crane vibration is, is decreased, but it is absolutely the exception rather than a rule in uh, runway installations. Okay. So rail movement, again, we were mentioning this, rail, rail should be able to float lengthwise, but never, but never side to side. And so if you're looking um, at, at the clip, you do not want any space. If you, so if you see where it says undesirable there, the space in between the nose of the flange and the clip itself, if you're seeing space, that's going to cause the rail movement from side to side. And then you're going to have some space for the clip as it goes up the slope of the flange. There is some space there between that and the webbing. That's necessary there before that it allows the bow wave in the wave. So you're really not going to see it with your eye, but that you'll actually have basically a wave in the steel as the crane is riding, depending on how much weight you are are traveling with. It, it will create a wave. And Tommy, you want to want to talk about that anymore? Bow wave. That's the difference between North Carolina and New York. Uh, what they call a bow wave, and it's very you do you get a bow or a wave in front of the leading wheel on heavy cranes. Um, and that space that Peter is talking about there, which says the loud bow wave, is even if it's not there when it's originally installed, it is eventually going to develop there uh, because that is going to happen to the to the rail. It is going to it is going to bow up. It slides. It bows up and it slides. It bows up and it slides. And then, assuming the crane does a relatively equal amount of work in both directions, um, any movement that occurs left to right will also occur right to left on the rail. And you'll never see the evidence of this um, unless or until you pull the rail up and look at, at uh, the supporting structure underneath. Okay, then you want to look at your rail splices, looser missing bolts, the rail, the rail gap, the gapping on there uh, is a maximum of 1 16th of an inch. Make sure they're aligned properly. And if welded, you want to make sure that they're joined properly. And uh, there's a picture of a rail, so there's the gapping. So that gap needs to be measured for uh, make sure it's one sixteenth max, and that they're properly aligned. And uh, there's a picture of a welded rail. Okay. And uh, Tom, you want to explain that slide here? It's some people get concerned or wonder if this is okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with welding rails. It's typically not done because it's so labor intensive. Um, there is a process that some people use for new installations. Originally, the trade name, trademark name, was uh, flash butt welding. Um, but you'll see this this section of rail in the photo here has been welded. It was probably a repair. Uh, sections of rail start to separate. Uh, crane wheels drop into them. They separate more, and it's just kind of a self-perpetuating effect. <clears throat> and this is a, a weld that was performed in 1940, and it's still in pretty good shape. Uh, it is just a repair. You can see where the, the two holes are there. The splice plate was removed. They welded it up. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. Uh, and it's actually quite amazing that the weld is in such good condition because anybody that has done this knows that it's very much a temporary type thing. It's very difficult to get a good weld, uh, stick weld. 
on two sections of rail. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but th there is absolutely nothing wrong with this whatsoever. It's not uncommon to see it. it typically, is the way you're looking at it now is a result of a repair. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And uh, Tom, I'll have you explain this. This is what we've been talking about before. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, you, know, you know, I guess the scientific way of, of doing a rail assessment. And, um, not that this is any less, but it's probably the, um, a simpler way to do a rail assessment. When we start out up front, we showed uh, all the considerations and measurements uh, that are taken into account when we install a runway. And we talked a little bit about the effects of uh, not having a runway installed properly. So um, in a nutshell, the way I like to look at this is um, there's a couple of different ways you can go about inspecting or assessing your cranes. And one of those, the very first easiest, most proactive thing you can do is to check your wheel to rail orientation. And what this picture is showing is four different sets of orientations. You got two wheels uh, on the far left here. <laughs> Excuse me. That uh, the the running that what I'm looking at here is the crane wheel to rail orientation as a crane travels down the runway. And I'm not suggesting that you follow the crane while it travels down the runway, run behind it or whatever. Um, but you can stop the crane, look at the wheel to rail orientation on the same girder side, uh, such as the A1 side or the A2 side. Look at the wheel to rail orientation and then move the crane another 10 to 20 feet. Stop it. Look at the wheel to rail orientation. And you do this over a, a pretty good representation of the length of the runway. And if you notice that your crane is tracking consistently wheel to rail relationships such as uh, the slide number one, it is absolutely an elevation problem with the runway. There's nothing else. The crane is slipping or moving to the right. It's uh, riding on the inboard flange on the, on the uh, right side wheel, the outboard flange on the left side wheel. Uh, there's very, very uh, few other things that would cause this. I can't personally think of, of anything that would cause this on a, on a continual basis. And if you go to the next one over, again, this is very proactive. I'm watching the crane track. Um, I'm looking at this, and I see number two constantly uh, in various spaces over 700 feet of runway. I, I look at this, and it's constantly making outboard flange contact on both sides of the crane. My span is too wide. It's there's there's one other option that's very uh, unlikely. I won't talk about it. And you go to the next one, constant inboard flange contact. It, all of these are undesirable if they're a constant thing. And this is where the crane's uh, runway span is too narrow. Cranes don't grow in length. The span does not grow. So the runway is too narrow. And the one on the far right is just the opposite of the first one. Um, the left side of the runway is lower than the right. And where Pete and I are kind of going with this is this would really be the the most desirable first and best way to assess your crane that should be done on your annual inspections or even more often. But by doing this, I can positively and absolutely with 99% accuracy tell you from this what's wrong with your runway in these areas, not just me, anyone, um, and I can predict what the failure will be. You will lose flanges. Uh, you may lose bearings because of the excessive forces could go back to shafts. But the real dangerous part of this, it's not dangerous here um, in terms of, I don't see any uh, immediate danger here, but when you get down to that bottom row of pictures, when, the, when it is sufficient enough that you're eroding or wearing away railhead, uh, you get to a point, I don't have these figures memorized, you get to a point where uh, you lose a certain amount of railhead, railhead width or mass in the head and it does get to a point where it becomes a, a safety type issue. And again, this is the most proactive way. Look at your wheels, look at your rail, look at the relationship, and you can fix it now or you can wait till your wheel flanges are gone. Um, and mo most people do is just replace wheels. So go ahead, Pete, that's about all I got to say. Yeah, Actually, and Tom, I ide ideally, right, if you're yeah, ideally if you're watching this, Tom, your crane's going to go through if, 
it's going to, I shouldn't say the word slide, but it's going to move back and forth through all these iterations, um, and that would be a healthy crane, correct? Not, it's not stuck oh. on one on one particular, like it wouldn't be always number one. So if you're at number one and you look at it again, and then you're at the number three uh, picture there, and then you move it again and you're back to number one or two, that, that's, that's typical, right? Good point. Um, I would want to see, I'm just going to throw a figure out there, if I move the crane down a 500 foot runway and I looked at it in 10 different spots, in, uh, one time I'd want to see the orientation on the left. Um, the next time I'd want to see the orientation all the way on the right. Um, if I saw at one or two spots the, the, the orientation, the second one from the right, where uh, I have outboard flange contact, but it didn't last very long, um, and then it moved over back to the uh, right flange contact, back over to left flange contact, that would be pretty normal. Uh, there's no runway that's perfect except maybe the day it goes in. So that would be normal. What we're talking about here is constant, consistent tracking in these orientations for long, long distances on the crane. So that's yes. a good point, Pete. Thanks. Deesley, you had a question? Yes, I would actually like to do a polling question. So uh, we just like to do these to kind of get a little feedback from all of you, break it up a bit. So what are the signs of tracking issues? Loud steel on steel sound during bridge travel, bearings and trucks, uh, and truck wheels and rails needing frequent replacement, broken wheel flanges, wheel pressed against the rail head, or all of the above. If you could just uh, click and vote, that would be great. And um, if some of you are on an iPad, it'll be much more difficult. Uh, you can just ping me your answer in the Q&A pane. I don't think you're allowed to vote on an iPad. So anyway, oh, Peter, looks like of the 65% who have voted, coming up to 70%, 100% agree on all of the above. Is that the correct yeah. answer? Yeah, that's correct, and that was the very first slide we put up, the signs that you would uh, try to address some tracking issues with your cranes. Fantastic, fantastic, great. So now we'll go back to the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So next up we want to look at is we want to look at the end truck structure and uh, we do a wheel assessment. So basically we're, in, and this time usually done is in, in your annual inspection anyway, is that correct? Yeah, going back to the wheels, uh, this would go hand in hand with looking at the tracking characteristics and, and someone should pay attention to this on, on an annual basis during, during those inspections. That's at a minimum. So let's take a look at the wheel. And this is an example of a straight thread top running wheel. Okay. So I am to inspect our tread wear patterns, polished tread flange, flat spots, flange thickness. You know, we're going to replace that 50% wear. Pitting, spalling, or case crushing, dark spots, fillet buildup. Total wheel float per the CMA specifications is three quarter to one inch total wheel float. And if you look at that uh, picture there, um, as far as the rail head, you have three eighths to half inch um, between the rail head and the starting of the slope of that wheel. Okay, drive wheel must be matched within 0 .001 inch diameter. Diameter and per inch of um, one thousandth of an inch per inch of uh, per diameter of the wheel up to a max of ten thousandths. Right, and we got the next slide. will explain if that's confusing to people. The next slide will explain. So if, basically, if your diameters are are slightly different, you know, your next slide's pretty pretty good slide, Tom. That if your diameter and how the distance of travel starts to vary based on the diameter being different. That so that's basically you know when you take your circumference of your wheel tread, if they're different, obviously the amount of travel is going to be different, which can cause a tracking issue. Um, idle, idle wheels within three sixteenths of the same diameter of the drive wheel. And Tommy mentioned that idle wheels, you know, normally are, are really not that big of an issue than the drive wheel. Not that big an issue, um, but idler wheels become leaders. I mean, the crane goes in one direction, uh, your drive wheels are leading. The crane goes in the other direction, your idler wheels are are leading. And if your idler wheels are off enough, even though they're idler wheels, it will adversely affect the tracking. And you'll see it's it's quite a big difference between three sixteenths of an inch and uh, one one thousandth to ten thousandths. No, here's a, a a pretty good slide of, of showing you know a rubbing of the rail on the flange of the wheel, and you're going to see a wear pattern on the rail as well. 
um, just by looking at the wheels and wheel of, wheel of, uh, and rail flange um, areas that are touching. And to go back to where we were talking about the circumference of the wheels being different, and Tom, you can I'll let you explain this, but it's it's not much. And, in, and we're talking we're talking you can see in, in a, a short amount of runway how the wheels travel different distances. So if you're you know you were talking about earlier like 500 700 foot spans, you, you're going to start seeing tracking issues just by wheel wear. We are, and one of the big things, and everybody out there listening, is uh, those of you that have been involved in changing wheels on a crane, um, when you change out a drive wheel, I know every manufacturer, every crane expert will tell you to always change out your drive wheels in pairs. And that is sound information. It's a wise thing to do. But in the real world, there's a lot of things that come into it. Cost time, downtime, um, depending on the crane, turning, changing out a drive wheel could, could take an entire shift. Um, if there's nothing wrong with the other one, why would I want to change that? So I, I understand all of that stuff. But if you've got five or 10 or 15 years on your drive wheels and you buy one brand new drive wheel, the example we've used here is uh, an 18 inch, that was an original manufactured diameter on the wheel. Um, and you've replaced the one on the left here and you get it just dead on. The manufacturer nailed it at 18 inches, but you're going to leave the existing one off. Uh, I'm sorry, the existing one on the crane, again, a lot of reasons for people that do that, um, it's only 17.98 inches and uh, that doesn't seem like a lot, but when it comes to cranes and crane tracking, that is a tremendous amount. CMAA specs only 10 thousandths difference, depending on the size of the wheel. This is 20 thousandths off. So you take that diameter difference, multiply it by pi, and every revolution of that wheel um, for the wheels on the crane, the left side is going to travel 60 thousandths farther uh, than the right side. Again, it doesn't seem like much. After just six revolutions on this example, I think it's six, um, the left side has gone one-third of an inch farther than the right side. And I know that doesn't seem like a lot. You're looking at a 50 to 150 ton crane, but you take that down a 400, 500, 600, 7 foot, uh, 700 foot runway and put the trolley to the right side, carry the load to the right side, um, on all of these things, you're going to have horrible, horrible, horrible tracking problems. Um, mismatched drive wheels are probably one of the most common things that I came across when I was out working on, on cranes in terms of tracking problems. So there's a lot of merit to that statement that uh, when you change drive wheels, change them in pairs. There's good reason for it. It's not sales. Mm -hmm. So that's about all I have to Very say. Very good. Yeah, that's, that's, that's and that's a pretty good slide. I, li I like that. It's kind of you know hits home to me. That kind of hits home. Um, so anywhere, look at the end truck. The bearing housing ensure nuts and bolts are in place. Bearing housing flush against the end truck. Uh, if key stock is used, check for movement of cracked beads. Check for cracks in the housing, and the radius on the end truck can cause a stress concentration point. And check carefully signs of fatigue, scaling, and or cracking. So basically, we're looking at the structure. That would cause maybe the the wheel not to not to sit in there properly, which will cause tracking issues. In the structure, we're looking at the rail sweeps. Uh, be sure they're um, proper. You can have three sixteenths max above the rail head to your rail sweep, and between the head and the uh, rail sweep, you got three maximum plus three eighths of an inch. Okay, and that's all that. Where that comes from, you can, for top running cranes, you'll find that 1910-179 for OSHA, CMAA spec number 70, ASB B32, which is for top running cranes, and B3017-1.9 are the reference for that. Um, At this point, you can take any up. Go ahead, Gisela. Okay. Great, Peter. This is the time for you all to type in your questions. I know Eduardo raised his hand and I, I asked him what his question was and his question is, sometimes only one side or one rail gets damaged. What would be the problem in this situation? That would, I don't necessarily have an answer. I'd have to watch, watch the crane track, look where the crane goes, um, why one side is damaged and another one isn't. Perhaps you have there is an anomaly in that section of rail, and it's it's in a confined, if you will, a limited area. 
What that can you explain? Guess. Can you explain anomaly? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I can. But it'll the, re the reason no. is you have such great vocabulary that not everybody here has English as their first language. So okay, you got let's say in a 500 foot runway, you've got six or eight or ten feet of rail that, for one reason or another, are either bowed in, bowed out, been in, been out, or they're up or down or, or outside the tolerance. But it only really occurs in a limited area. Mm -hmm. That's that's a guess. It's an educated guess, but without further information we're looking at, that's about as far as I'd like to guess. Okay, so you think it's just a limited area? That would be my first guess. Okay. All right, if you have any other questions, you can type them in. Excellent. He said thank you. Okay, so I have another question for you. If we replace part of the rail runway, does a load test need to be performed on the crane system? No. Oh, okay. And why would that be? I mean, because you haven't affected the supporting structure. Um, the I beam that supports the rail is uh, the supporting structure. Okay. And the real reason, or th the actual legal reason, is um, if you read through all the standards, all the specifications, um, there is no requirement listed in there. So if we're looking strictly from a, a legal standpoint, uh, it's kind of a cliche that helps me remember this. Omission is permission, meaning if it's not in there and it doesn't say in the standards that you have to do that, you do not. Okay. Okay. All right. That helps. So anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask, you can do so now. And in the meantime, Peter, why don't you go ahead and, and move on with a couple more slides, and then we can address the final questions at the end. Okay. A um, couple of the courses coming up. Uh, qualified Rigger Workshop, August 25th to 27th, Rigging an Overhead Crane Operator, Train to Trainer in June 15th to the 19th and August 24th to 28th. We have a Hoist Repair Certification course, July 20th and 24th. Uh, chain Hoist Repair Certification, July 9th to 11th and July 20th or 22nd. Um, and there'll be some, there are some Crane and Hoist Inspection courses coming up shortly as well. Um, I believe in August, you go, if you go on our website, www.cmcodepot.com, um, the crane and hoist uh, inspection course, basically where this webinar is a little snippet that we took out of that course uh, came from. If you, so if you want to learn more about crane inspections um, and, and hoist inspection, this is the entire system, then you want to take the crane and hoist inspection course. It's a, it's a three-day course and uh, you can imagine this, you know, the little bit we, what we covered here today um, in, in 30 minutes. Uh, how long that course, you know, what, what you can learn in that course in three days and um, the, some of the things we, we just touched upon, some of the basic tracking things and things you can check, but there's a lot more to it than just what we covered in this course. We just kind of, this is more of a, hey, here could be some of the issues, but there's certainly a lot more to it than what we've covered. Um, the chain and wire rope repair or the chain hoist repair, that is strictly a repair for a hoist. We take apart the hoist and basically nut by nut, bolt by bolt, spring by spring, show you what to look for, how to repair them, how to uh, do electrical problems. Um, so that, that's a repair course that's not to be confused with the crane inspection course, which is pretty much external of the system, just writing up deficiencies. There's two drastically different courses that people kind of confuse the two. Okay, Peter, I have three more questions that have come in. And we have five more minutes left of our webinar. We don't like to keep you any longer than we agreed to at the beginning of 45 minutes. So question number one, if you have multiple cranes on the runway, one track's okay, but the other doesn't, what would you look for? Hey, Pete, you want to do this one? I would suspect a wheel issue then with one of the cranes. So if one is tracking fine and the other isn't, there, there would be something with the structure of the crane itself and not a, not, the, not a rail problem, so I would check the wheels of that crane and possibly make sure and check the span of that second crane, um, the, the crane structure itself, and be sure it's in line with the rail. Okay. That's what I would do. Perfect. Okay. Next question from Daniel. Rail to flange contact is op, let's see, rail to flange contact is opposite end to end of end truck. The rail-to-flange contact is opposite end-to-end -end 
uh, sorry, end to end of end truck. Does that make sense? No, I don't. Okay, I don't understand. to elaborate. Daniel, if you could just add a little bit more to your question, that would be great. I know with this, with this messaging thing, it's uh, we get a lot of different um, snippets. So if you can elaborate, we'd love to answer your question. Next one is, what should be the ratio on the parameters on a driven wheel? Right. I don't understand what ratio. What should be the ratio on the perimeters? Per, sorry, not parameters. Perimeters on a driven wheel. Um, and some of this might also be in translation. So, if uh, unless they're talking, unless they're talking about the diameter of the wheels, which you know Tom just covered about the diameters of the wheels being in you know within tolerance of which of each other. That's the only thing that where I could think he's asking. Ratio okay. of the diameter. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't. Okay, you know what we'll do? What we can do is we will email both uh, both of these gentlemen after the fact. Oh, that's what he's talking about. Okay, so you know what we'll do? Um, we will reach out to both gentlemen after the fact via email, and then we can get your questions addressed. I'm sorry, uh, I apologize for that. So, and we did have one more person who just had their hand raised. Let me see. Oh, and I just can't find out now who that was. But um, anyway, if you have your hand raised to ask a question, um, please go ahead and type it in quick, and then we can address it. I'll, I'll, uh, perfect. Yes, Joe, thank you. Are the standards the same for top-running and underhung bridge systems? The runway alignment standards are identical. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So if anyone has a, a final question, you can do so. I'm going to go ahead and just wrap this up now. But I wanted to show you that we, for those of you that joined early, we have a blog. We have over 150 articles on our blog. And typically we take uh, a question or two from our safety webinars that seem to be very popular. And Peter will address them on the blog. And um, we're also on a variety of social media channels. If you look on the bottom, we're on Twitter both for the industrial and the entertainment side. We have a YouTube channel where we have over 30 safety webinars like this on there from the last three years that you can view. If you would like to download them all or have them all on your, on your company's system, we can sell them to you on a flash drive for a very minimal cost. And that way you could have them all and you could plug them right into your system at work so you can view them. We get requests for that a lot. We're on Facebook. Look up Columbus McKinnon on Facebook. We share a lot of stories and pictures there. We're on LinkedIn, Google+, and even Instagram. So go and find us. We'd love to connect with you there. And if you ever have questions or concerns or pictures or whatever, um, we would love to hear from you. Okay, there is one more question that came in, which was uh, a little extension on something asked earlier. So um, on one end truck drive wheel rail to flange is inside and the other wheel is outside. Uh, let me see, rail to flange contact, does that make sense or I, I think we might just need, still need to be able, oh the crane is running. Yeah, the leading rail, the leading rail is on one side and the other, the, the, the idler wheel is on the other. Can you say that again Peter? I'm just wondering if you feel the front leading wheel is on one side of the on flange. On the inside, and the other wheel is on the outside. Contact. On the same on the same end truck. I'm thinking so. And he said the crane is running. Yes, he says yes. That's Let's called skewing, um, and there are several things that could cause that: weight okay. distribution, motor drives. Uh, it's but it's called skewing. Um, skewing is, is not necessarily um, caused by the, the runway at all. So skewing is not caused by the runway? No, it, I'm not going to say it never is, but uh, skewing is just as likely to be the crane. 70% of all crane tracking problems are due to the runway. Skewing is not one that I could put in that category. Okay. okay. So it could be the crane. Okay. Oh gosh. Well, you know what we'll do um, for anybody on the call. We will. Oh, you're include... typing this stuff, aren't you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was wondering if you were typing this stuff as I was, and I was talking a lot. Go ahead. No, you know what I'm doing. I just, uh, I kind of ask the questions. I, I kind of go through after the fact and grab, grab the details, but it's too much for me to.
also be added to our email distribution list for future safety webinars should you like to join us again. So thank you, everyone, and we wish you um, a very nice rest of your week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.